So the very topics, you know, that we're going to see here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, these um, first 17 verses, um, you know, these are things that have been on my mind, that have been on my heart. And, you know, on Wednesdays, as we've been gathering uh, with the men, we've been going through the book of Genesis. And some of the topics we've been hitting um, involve faith and obedience, particularly in the life of Abraham. And um, on Sundays, you know, back there with the youth group, we've been going through the book of Acts. And um, I'm, I'm pretty excited about that because we just started that about, uh, you know, two weeks ago. And, you know, there we've been talking about um, the, the beginning of the church age, the beginning of the early church. And uh, all of these things come together here as, um, as we go through 1 Corinthians um, chapter 3, these first 17 verses. And as a church today, it's important that we continue maturing in our faith. And also we continue busy in building the Lord's kingdom, building his church, and pointing as many people as we possibly can um, to Jesus Christ. And in fact, if you look in the epistle of James, there it tells us specifically that faith without works is dead and works without faith is dead. And you need to have those two and a balance of those two um, as we run this Christian race together as brothers and sisters um, in Christ. And this is something that the Apostle Paul will talk about and will remind us of here this morning and the fact that we need to continue maturing in our faith and building the church. So before we actually get into the study, let me go ahead and open up in a word of prayer And then we'll read the text together, and then we'll look at this um, verse by verse. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this morning. We thank you for this beautiful time of worship, Lord, this this time of gathering. And we just pray this morning that you would speak to us through your word. You are the word, Lord, and we just pray that you would speak to us and guide us and lead us. Help us to have understanding and just help us to have the insight you desire us to do, Lord. And um, I pray this morning that you fill this place, fill us with your Holy Spirit. And just help us to be blessed, Lord. We thank you for this time. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. So here the Apostle Paul writes, For my part, brothers and sisters, I was not able to speak to you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as babies in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, since you are not yet ready for it. In fact, you are still not ready, because you are still worldly. For since there is envy and strife among you, are you not worldly and behaving like mere humans? For whenever someone says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos, are you not acting like mere humans? Verse 5. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? They are servants through whom you believed. And each has the role the Lord has given. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So then, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's co-workers. You are God's field, God's building. According to God's grace that was given to me, I have laid a foundation as a skilled master builder, and another builds on it, but each one is to be careful how he builds on it, for no one can lay any foundation other than what has been laid down. That foundation is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, Each one's work will become obvious, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire. The fire will test the quality of each one's work. If anyone's work that he has built survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will experience loss. But he himself will be saved, but only as um, through fire. Don't Don't you yourselves know that you are God's temple and that the Spirit of God lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and that is what you are. Amen. All right, so this morning there are a couple of things we're going to look at here um, through the text. So the first thing I want to talk about is in the first um, eight verses. And what we're going to see here is we're going to see carnal behavior 
there in the church of Corinth. Okay, the carnality that was taking place there in, in Corinth. And here we are reminded of the fact that if we do not keep growing in our faith and in our maturity in the Lord, we're going to find ourselves becoming comfortable and complacent. And that's a dangerous place to be because that can be um, the playground uh, for the enemy. So if you notice here in the first verse, Paul confronts their condition. He says, For my part, brothers and sisters, I was not able to speak to you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as babes in Christ. So even though these people were in Christ, they were in the church, they were very carnal. If you remember, the Corinthian church was coming out of this uh, pagan society, and um, there was probably a lot of issues that were still uh, residual, that were lasting there, um, even after coming to Jesus Christ. And in just a little bit, when we get into the third verse, we'll talk about those problems um, specifically. Now, the term carnal Christians sounds contradicting, doesn't it? Like you're either a believer or you're a make-believer, right? Or you're a, a saint or you're an ain't, right? You're either in the faith or you're not in the faith. But it's interesting because Paul refers to them as brothers and sisters here. So they are in the faith. However, what is likely happening here is that perhaps every aspect of their life was not being dominated by the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. And I think a lot of us today can, you know, we can relate to that. You know, sometimes we're not willing to give those things up to the Lord because our flesh loves them so much. Or we've gotten to a point where it becomes so habitual that we don't even recognize those things. And we need the Word of God and the Lord Himself to reveal those things to us so we can give them um, to the Lord. So that way, every aspect of our life is, um, is following the Holy Spirit as the Lord leads us. And, you know, we're all a work in progress until we see the Lord face to face. But here, these were some issues that really needed to be addressed um, here in the church of Corinth. And it's interesting because sometimes we even think the things we do in secret, like the Lord doesn't even know what's going on. But if you look in the book of Hebrews, they're the author in verse 13 of chapter 4. He writes, No creature is hidden from him, but all things are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. And, you know, the Lord sees everything. He knows everything. He knows our hearts. He knows us better than we even know um, ourselves. Now, if you look in the chapter before this, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it talks about the natural man and the spiritual man, okay? And when you think of the natural man, that's like an individual who hasn't received Jesus Christ into their lives. They don't know the things of God. All they know are the things of the flesh. And then you have the spiritual man. That's an individual who has allowed the Lord to come into to their lives and change them. And then, of course, you have the carnal, the carnal man or carnal woman, those who know the things of God, but in many ways, they're still characterized by the flesh, okay? And I think the question becomes this morning, what kind of person are we? Are we the natural man or the natural woman? Are we the natural, I'm sorry, the spiritual man or the spiritual woman, woman or the carnal man or the carnal woman? Like, what defines us um, this morning? And I think that's something we need to continuously evaluate in ourselves, as, as Paul's told us, right? to constantly evaluate whether we're still in the faith, if we're in the faith, right, or, or how we're growing in the faith. Um, now, if you look in the next few verses here, verse 2 through the first half of verse 3, um, what we see is the consequences of their behavior, right? Because we know that there's always going to be consequences to our disobedience to God, to our sin. And here Paul tells us, he says, I gave you milk to drink, um, not solid food, since you are not yet ready for it. In fact, you are still not ready because you are still worldly. Uh, so notice here that Paul, he continues to preach to them very simply, okay? Not in depth. And they were not even living up to those most basic teachings or those most basic principles. So clearly they were not ready yet for, those, for that solid food, if you want to call it that. That solid teaching that would help them continue growing in their maturity because they weren't quite ready for it. And I can tell you as a believer and as one of the pastors here, you know, our desire for everyone, ourselves included, for everyone here, um, is that we continue growing in our walk and in our maturity 
for the Lord. You know, every time we see each other, our desire should be that we are closer to God than the last time we saw each other. And, you know, in reading this verse, it, it, you know, it kind of reminded me of my, my nephew. I have a nephew. His name is Tristan. He's, um, he just turned 12 years old. And I remember when he was a baby, you know, I had to feed him with a bottle because he didn't have any teeth. And if I would have given him, you know, like, you know, carne asada or something, he would have, he would have choked. His body wouldn't have been able to process um, that, that type of food. He wasn't ready yet for solid food. He was on the bottle. And as he got older, you know, he went to some, you know, um, what do you call that? Not uh, blended food, I guess, you know. And then eventually, you know, he started eating solid food. And, you know, he's 12 years old, like I said, and, you know, he eats like a man now. He likes ribeye steaks and... You know, I took him to McDonald's the other day and like the Happy Meal's not enough. You know, he has to get like the number 10 or something. So it's very clear here that as he matured, that food became more solid. And it would be unusual for him to be 12 years old and to continue um, perhaps being on the bottle or something like that, right? And I mean, when you think about that as believers, we don't want to stay in the same place. We never want to be comfortable where we are with the Lord in our faith, in our walk. We always want to have that desire to continue growing. And the truth of the matter is, you and I in this room, we are as close to God as we choose to be. So it is our responsibility to continue seeking the scriptures and not just depend on the pastors on Sundays and on Wednesdays to feed us and to guide us, but the Holy Spirit is our discipler. He's going to guide us. He's going to lead us. And we have the word of God, the basic instructions before leaving earth. It's all in there. And we may not have the answers to everything because there are mysteries in there that the Lord hasn't revealed to us. However, we do have that responsibility. And we know that the gospel can be taught at different levels. Um, however, like we just read here, the Corinthians, they were not quite ready for um, those solid studies. And it wasn't because God was preventing them from receiving the solid food or the solid word, but rather they were not willing or ready um, to receive it. They were continuing to be very carnal um, in their behavior, okay? So the Corinthians and their carnality were, ask, were acting like little kids. So Paul was treating them like little children or little kids. Now, if you look in the next uh, section here, the second part of verse 3 and into verse 4, here we see a picture of their carnal carnality uh, painted for us. So it says... For since there is envy and strife among you, are you not worldly and behaving like mere humans? For whenever someone says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos, are you not acting like mere humans? So what we see happening here in Corinth in this time is that there was a lot of envy and there was a lot of strife, and there was some divisiveness also taking place. And when you think about this, you know, whenever there's something wrong with human behavior or relationships, there's something wrong with the heart and there's something going on with the relationship with God. And, you know, it's important to note as brothers and sisters in Christ, you know, we're going to have conflicts because we're still in the flesh. But at the end of the day, we're united in Christ Jesus and those things should be resolvable. Um, but here, this was a continuous thing that Paul had to address. Now, if you look in the Proverbs, Proverbs 4.23 tells us, Guard your heart above all else, for it is the source of life. So we need to guard our hearts with all diligence, because that's where the problems of life stem from, the issues of life stem from. And we, we have to make sure that our hearts are in alignment with the Lord's heart. And that's only possible with the power and the person of the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, right? And, um, of course, accountability from other brothers and sisters in Christ. But certainly as a church, we never want to have any divisiveness or division in the church. Right now in the world, there's a lot of division. There's a lot of divisiveness. Um, you're either here or you're there. But in Christ Jesus, there should be unity. Because if we look and we act like the world does, how are we supposed to win the world for Christ? We're not any different, right? There should be a change. There should be a difference. Um, in our lives. Now, because of the envy and the strife and all this divisiveness, the Corinthians, in a sense, they were kind of enslaved. They were becoming these slaves to man, to these men, 
Apollos and to Paul, when they should have just been slaves to the Lord. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. If you look in the next few verses, it talks a little bit about the foolishness of exalting church leaders. That's like a bad thing to do. You don't want to exalt any church leaders. And we'll talk about this here. Um, Verse 5 says, What then is Apollos? What is Paul? They are servants through whom you believed, and each has the role the Lord has given. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So, as a church, we all belong to the Lord, right? We should always point people to Jesus Christ. You know, when you think about the church today, we never want to point people to a man, to a politician, to a movement. You want to point people to Jesus Christ because only Jesus Christ can save people. Not a president, not a person, not not any type of movement. It has to be Jesus Christ. And that's where we need to be careful. Um, And with the Corinthians here, because of this divisiveness, you know, like I said, they were becoming enslaved um, to to men, to individuals. And we never want that to occur. Never depend on a man for your walk because we are all flawed. It doesn't matter who's behind the pulpit. It doesn't matter where you are on your walk. We are not unsusceptible to the sin, to the things that used to bind us because we're still in the flesh. So we need to make sure, and even when you're ministering to people, that you point people to the word of God and not to you or to your own insight. You can talk about your own experiences, but at the end of the day, it has to be counsel that is biblical and it's the word of God because that's going to last forever, right? So those are the things we have to keep in mind as we continue growing as brothers and sisters in Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, uh, verse 22 and 23, It says, for he who is called by the Lord as a slave is the Lord's freed man. Likewise, he who is called as a free man is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of people. So in a sense, this is what was happening uh, to the Corinthians as they were taking sides. They were being divisive. You know, Paul Paul and Apollos, rather, were not the individual's they believed on for salvation, okay? It was Christ Jesus whom they believed on for salvation. They were just the vessels, right? They were, they are through whom they believed, not on whom they believed, okay? It was through them, not on them, um, that they believed on Christ Jesus. So that's something we need to, um, to, to be careful of here, okay? And another thing we saw in these verses is it said here that, you know, Paul planted and and Apollos watered. So what you see here are these different, um, these different jobs, these different uh, talents, these different things being used um, in the church. And once again, this is for building the, the kingdom of God. And that's what's exciting because you, you, you think about everyone who's in this room right now. You know, the word of God tells us we have at least one gift, right? And There are so many gifts and talents in this room that we're going to use for the purposes of building God's kingdom. We're all going to do it a different way, but at the end of the day, it's for the Lord's glory. And once again, what we see here that there are different jobs or different responsibilities. And it it kind of reminded me of that section that's a little bit later in um, in this letter where the Apostle Paul talks about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And if, if you um, are unfamiliar with the gifts, or maybe you're a little bit rusty on the gifts of the Holy Spirit, that's okay. Um, I encourage you, maybe a little bit later, uh, for homework. We assign homework here, don't we, sometimes? Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Ephesians chapter 4, and Romans chapter 12, uh, 12 rather, there it speaks of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, there specifically, it likens the gifts of the Holy Spirit to a full functioning body. And um, I don't know about you, but when you hurt, like, I don't know, like the smallest possible part of your body, like your pinky, like your whole body is debilitated, right? Like you can't function. Um, and this is, this is true. Like with the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the body is a whole. Like we need every part of the body. Um, or else we can't function uh, as a unit and we can't necessarily progress the Lord's work. I mean, it'll continue as he desires, 
but we don't want to be a hindrance in that process, right? We want to use those gifts. But at the end of the day, with all these gifts and talents, you know, um, because not everyone's going to be a worship leader, not everyone's going to be a pastor, not everyone's going to be, you know, a youth leader or whatever. You're going to do it in a different way as you build God's kingdom. But at the end of the day, there's unity because all of those things are manifested by the power and the person of the Holy Spirit. If you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the first, um, actually it's verse 4 through verse 7, it says, Now there are different gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different ministries, but the same Lord. And there are different activities, but the same God works all of them in each person. A manifestation of the Spirit is given to each person for the common good. Okay, so all of those gifts, all of those um, talents, all those things, they're to edify the church, build up the church, and they are in unity in Christ alone. And in just a little bit, when we get into verse 8, I believe it is, Paul will talk a little bit about um, that unity. And you now, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, in, in the youth group, we, we just started the book of Acts um, about two weeks ago, and, and I'm pretty stoked about it, I'm excited about it. Maybe, maybe a little bit more than, than the young people, but it's okay. Um, I'm excited about that because there, once again, we, we see the beginning of the church age, which is an age we are still living in right now. And we see the beginning of the early church taking place there. And, you know, sometimes you hear people say, you know, we don't have the same power. We don't have the same abilities as the early church does or did. But the truth of the matter is the Holy Spirit that came upon them then is the same Holy Spirit that we have complete access to now. And we just have to utilize that. I love what A.J. Gordon says regarding this. He says, Before Pentecost, the disciples found it hard to do easy things. But after Pentecost, they found it easy to do hard things. And when you think about it, like for example, in this room, you think about everyone in here, and, you know, I know we're not necessarily a big mega church right now. We're a small church. Um, however, when you think about the power that can take place when we allow the Holy Spirit to use us and to guide us, like, I honestly think we could win this city if we allowed the Holy Spirit to have his way in this place. But once again, that boils down to each of us individually, myself included, because there's days where we want to just be in the flesh again. We want to live how we used to live because... It's too much work to be in the spirit. You know, you got to surrender all those things. But those are things we have to pray for daily and throughout the week as, as we go through this, this race together. Now, as believers, we never want to do ministry. We never want to serve the Lord in our own power and our own abilities um, because then it becomes a burden. It becomes stressful. And, you know, one thing that I've struggled with in ministry is, is, is perfection. And not because I want to prove anything to anyone, but because it's for the Lord and you want to do the best for the Lord. But sometimes our, um, I guess, our expectations are so different from the Lord's expectations, right? And that's why we want to make sure that we're doing things in accordance to what God is telling us or calling us to do. And, and, and when I get a little bit stressed out about things or anxious about things when I'm serving, I know that I need to step back and let the Holy Spirit fill me again and guide me and lead me. And maybe that's the same for everyone in here as well. But even when things don't turn out how you would expect them to, they turned out how the Lord wanted them to. And at the end of the day, he sees your heart. He sees your efforts in, in, in doing those things. So that's where the, the comfort is because you're doing it for the Lord. Now, if you look in verse 7, um, Paul continues and he says, So then, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth, right? So all the glory goes to God. In the book of Isaiah chapter 42, there in verse 8, there he reminds us that the Lord is not going to share his glory with anybody. Okay, I don't, I don't care who you are. He will not share his glory with you. And here it's very clear that all the glory goes to the Lord because even though like Paul planted and Apollos watered, it was the Lord who gave the increase. It wasn't them. And only God can change hearts. Only God can change people. And that's what we see um, through many of the lives of the Corinthians. But it wasn't them. It was the Lord. All right. So we're going to go ahead and move into another section here um, in the Word. And this will encompass 
verse 8 all the way through verse 17. Okay, so we'll kind of camp out here for a little bit. Um, and I love this because in these verses, we're going to see the building of the church, okay, contributing to the building of the church. And here we're reminded of our roles, of our responsibilities as we continue running this race together and adding to the foundation of Jesus Christ, which is the foundation of the church. So if you look in verse 8 and in verse 9, uh, Paul writes, he says, Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's co-workers. You are God's field, God's building. So we know as brothers and sisters in Christ, as we continue um, serving the Lord and, and doing the Lord's will in our lives, we're, we're doing this together. But at the end of the day, we all have our own individual parts, our own labor, right, that we're going to, um, to be doing. And in this eighth verse here, Paul is, you know, he's telling the Corinthians, no, yes, one is watering, one is planting, but we're all united. We're doing the same thing. We're all, at the end of the day, our goal is Jesus, right? To point people to Jesus and to just see him face to face. That's our desire. And to tell as many people about him as possible. Now, Paul and Apollos, you know, they were just God's co-workers. They were, they were nothing else. They were just a servant. They were just servants, equal in their, in their work spreading the gospel message. Now, it's important to understand here, and, you know, I talked a little bit about the gifts of the Holy Spirit just a second ago, that one job will never, ever be more important than another job. And what I, what I mean by that is our service unto the Lord. So whether you, you clean the church, whether you, you know, are back with the young people, or you're the senior pastor, all of those roles are just as important and necessary to progress the Lord's kingdom. And we have to understand that because sometimes maybe, you know, we're doing something in the church and it's like, oh, well, it's just cleaning, you know, I'll just, I'll just clean it whenever I can, or I, I just won't clean, I'll come, you know, once every three, every three months or something. Um, at the end of the day, you got to do your best because it's for the Lord. And it's just as important as, you know, the senior pastor's um, position here as he prepares every week diligently to bring forth the word of God. So those are things we have to keep in mind. We have to take those, those uh, gifts and those tools that the Lord's given to us very seriously. And they, they shouldn't, be, um, shouldn't be taken lightly. So as we serve together, our roles are important, okay? And um, we need to continue building uh, the Lord's uh, kingdom. And then notice, you know, as I mentioned here, um, each one, according to their labor, will be, given, will be given their reward, okay? So this reward that's being spoken of here, it's not going to be based on talents. It's not going to be based on gifts or success in ministry, but rather it's going to be out of obedience and your labor onto the Lord, okay? Because God looks at the heart of a man and a woman, and he looks at our obedience, and once again, this is, this is something I struggle with is, um, you know, even when things don't turn out the way you expect them to or want them to, at the end of the day, if your heart is in the right place, you're doing what the Lord's called you to do, you're obedient to him, um, I think you're successful in ministry, right? Look at Jeremiah, right? The weeping prophet was like a 40-year ministry, like now one convert, but he was still faithful to the Lord. He couldn't stop, right? The word of God was like a fire inside of his heart and he, he couldn't stop doing it. And, you know, obedience and faithfulness to the Lord, that's where the success is in, um, in ministry. We're all God's workers. We're all co-workers, co-laborers um, in the Lord. And it's not because God needs us. We need God, but he desires to use us. Okay, that's his, his heart. Now, Paul and Apollos, once again, they were these co-workers, these co-laborers. They worked his field. You can think of that as the Corinthians themselves. And God's building, you can think of that as like the church there in Corinth, them, the church body. Okay, and then we'll talk more about this in a, in a little bit in verse, um, in verse 17. Okay, so these individuals, they are not, you know, they are what they are, not because of Paul or Apollos, but because of the work that God did through Paul and Apollos. Okay, that's what changed their lives. And now the word building there, um, that word is translated as a structure that is still under construction, okay? And um, I was thinking about this, and I don't know if this is like, um, 
like a Latino thing or a Mexican thing, but you always have that family member that their house has been under construction for like 50 years, right? And they're adding tile, they're adding the restroom, and it's just, it, it's never been finished. And that's like the church, right? It's never going to be finished, right? We have already accomplished much in building the church. Um, however, there's still more to do until the Lord comes um, to this earth for his second time, um, until his return. So the church is under construction, all right, for until the Lord comes back. And that's something we have to be okay with, I guess, um, because that's the Lord's will. But if you notice here in verse 10, um, it says, according to God's grace that was given to me, I have laid a foundation as a skilled master builder, and another builds on it, but each one is to be careful how he builds um, on it. So notice here that it's by God's grace that Paul is able to do the work that he is doing amongst um, the Corinthians. It's all because of God's grace. And certainly, um, if, we're not, if we're not making use of God's grace, we can't do any of these things, right? Because then we'd be doing them in our own um, in our own effort. And that grace, praise the Lord, is so freely given to us, right? So how do we receive that grace? Well, remember that gospel message. Number one, that Jesus died for our sins. Number two, that Jesus was buried. Number three, that Jesus rose uh, from the dead three days later, right? We put our faith in that message wholeheartedly. We declare that message. Uh, we recognize we're sinners, and we ask the Lord to forgive us of our sins, we allow the power and the person, the Holy Spirit, to come into our lives and to change us. That grace is what allows us to be used for the Lord's glory and to build um, his kingdom. And it's freely given to us, right? We have to choose it. Now, notice that in this verse, Paul also calls himself a skilled master builder. You know, you think about it, you know, Paul, after all, he had all this wisdom that the Lord had given to him, right? So even with the church in Corinth, you know, this was a church that he fathered back, I think it was during his second missionary journey. And if you look in the book of Acts, it's in chapter 18, there it talks about um, when he first uh, fathered this church there in, in, in Corinth. And that foundation that he laid there was the finished work on the cross, uh, which is Jesus Christ. And Paul knew that after him, more people were going to be adding to, um, to that foundation. And those that are adding to the foundation, they need to be careful um, because not just anything is worthy to be added to the foundation of, of the church. And we as believers, every single day, all of us, we are, we are the, the, the new generation of, of builders, if you want to call us that. We're the ones adding to the foundation now of the church. And we need to be careful with what we build with. Verse 11 is very, very specific. It says there, for no one can lay any foundation other than that has been laid down. That foundation is Jesus Christ. So Paul is very specific here, right? As to what type of foundation that needs to be um, laid. No other foundation other than that, which is Jesus Christ, can be laid down. We, we don't need to change what has already been established, right? Like, we need to just, just leave it alone. It's Jesus Christ. That's the foundation. And unfortunately, when you think about the church today, you, you hear a lot of churches that are, are preaching the me, myself, and I doctrine, the, the feel-good series doctrine, not pointing people to Jesus, but pointing people to other things, even themselves. So we got to be careful. We have to point people to Jesus Christ because that is the solid foundation that the church is sitting on right now. That way, when you point people to Jesus, they can add to the foundation um, those things which are of Christ Jesus and nothing else. And if you look in verse 12, he says, If anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become obvious, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire. The fire will test the quality of each one's work. If anyone's work that he has built survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will experience loss. But he himself will be saved, but only as um, through fire. 
So it's really clear here in verse 11 and in these verses here um, that we need to be very careful as to how we add to the foundation of, um, of the Lord's church. And I was thinking about this, um, and it reminded me of, of my time when I was, um, I was back as an undergraduate. I, was, I attended Texas Tech University several years ago, but I, w- I remember I was, studying, I was studying geophysics, and I was in a seismology class. There in seismology, you study earthquakes and you study like volcanoes. And I remember everyone would always talk about the big earthquake that still hasn't come yet in California. So if you're native to California, um, you probably know what I'm talking about. But I remember um, the big issue there was if you, if you go to California and you move maybe to like the San Francisco Bay Area, the land there is a bunch of backfill. So there are some very strict building codes in those areas. And, you know, it's suggested that whenever that big earthquake comes, that the land itself is going to turn into liquid. It's going to turn into like a fluid because it's just a bunch of backfill. And they call that term liquefaction is what, is what the geologic term is. But anyways, um, so there's some very strict uh, codes there for buildings. And the purposes of that is to make sure that those buildings are able to withstand the earthquakes and the, liquef- the, the liquefaction of the earth if that earthquake ever comes. And similarly, as the church, we have some very strict building codes as we continue adding on to the foundation of this church, right? And we want to make sure that whatever we contribute to the building of the Lord's church is going to withstand the waves that this world brings, the storms that this world brings, the liquefaction that this world brings, right? You think about the world right now. We're not necessarily in good shape right now. There's so many things going on across the globe. And we want to make sure that the church continues to remain steadfast and grounded in that foundation of Jesus Christ, which is the most solid foundation that you can build on. And that's why we need to be very careful as to what we add um, to that foundation. Now, notice in that 12th verse, you know, that I just read a while ago, right? It says, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, right? So notice there that um, he's using a little bit of symbolism here. He's describing these different materials, to, you know, to build an actual physical building. You know, he starts with gold. He works his way down to silver, down to stones, and then eventually to hay and, um, and to straw. Um, so you go from like the most precious materials to like the least precious materials um, in, that, in that, uh, that lineup there. And, you know, as we all have learned, you know, everyone knows the story of the three little pigs, right? Um, some of these materials are going to be stronger than others, right? Some are going to outlast the elements and others they're not. Okay, once again, Paul is using some nice symbolism here to describe these materials that we're going to be building the church with. And this kind of reminds me a little bit about the parable um, of the two foundations that, you know, Jesus presents to us, for example, in the Gospel of Matthew. If you remember Jesus, when he was physically on this planet in his earthly ministry, you know, he was on fire and he was, you know, sharing these parables and um, pointing people, you know, to the Father. Um, If you look in Matthew chapter 27, beginning of verse 24, Um, into verse 27, he says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. The rain fell, the rivers rose, and the winds blew and pounded that house. Yet it didn't collapse because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew and pounded that house, and it collapsed. It collapsed with a great crash. So, you know, Jesus here, he's speaking of these two structures, these two homes, in a sense. They look the same from the outside, but they have different foundations, right? So the thing you don't see. And, um, you know, they're made of these different materials, the one that was built on the rock, the one that was built on the sand. And those two foundations can be likened to the type of faith that somebody has um, in the Lord. And this example here is just as applicable to the materials that we use to add on um, to the foundation. So those materials need to be grounded in Jesus Christ. And once again, 
You can also think of it, you know, we are the church, and we'll talk about this in a little bit. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Our hearts need to be grounded in Christ Jesus. That way we continue to um, move this temple forward in the work of, of the Lord. And that's only possible to the Holy Spirit. And as we continue adding to the foundation, I love what Alan Redpath says regarding this. Um, he, he wrote a book. It's called The Royal Route to Heaven. And um, it, it's, it's an awesome book. I just finished reading it again. And it's based on the first and the second uh, letter of Corinthians. It's a study book through, through that. And um, there he writes, We are fit for the work of God only when we have slept over it, prayed about it, and are enabled by him to tackle the job that needs um, to be done. So this is very important that we, um, we understand that the, the, the materials that we're adding on symbolically to the building of the church, they need to be solidified in Christ Jesus because that's what the foundation is. Because notice in verse 13 what it tells us. It says, each one's work will become obvious for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. The fire will test the quality of each one's work. So what is this fire that is being spoken of here? Well, I believe what is being spoken of here is God's judgment. God's going to judge the things that we've done while we are on this planet. If you look in the book of Revelation, um, in chapter 19, beginning in verse 11 through verse 16, there it describes Jesus' return to this hostile earth. And there it says, and this is John speaking, Then I saw heaven opened, and there was a white horse. Its rider is called Faithful and True, and with justice he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a fiery flame, and many crowns were on his head. He had a name written that no one knows except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The armies that were in heaven followed him, on white horses, wearing pure white linen, a sharp sword came from his mouth so that he might strike the nations with it. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will also trample the winepress of the, fire, of the fierce anger of God and um, the fierce anger of God, the Almighty. And then verse 16, it says, And he has a name written on his robe and on his thigh, King of King and Lord of Lord. So there we have this description once again of Jesus' return to this hostile earth uh, there in the book of Revelation. Once again, these are things that have not occurred yet, but will occur um, in the future. As to when, I don't know when. Um, but notice here the description it gives us of his eyes, right? They were like fire. It describes them there. And when you think about the Lord, the Lord sees everything. He sees everything. He sees the depths of our hearts. Everything that we do for the Lord, he sees it. And we're going to be judged for those things that we do for the Lord. And, you know, you're thinking, wait, as believers, we're going to be judged. Well, you know, we are going to be judged. And, you know, I'm not talking about, and, you know, we, we talk about the book of Revelation. I'm not talking about the great white throne judgment that we read about for those that have, um, that have rejected the Lord. But rather, if you look in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 9 through 11, there it speaks of what we call the judgment seat of Christ or the bema seat of Christ, okay? And I think I've spoken of this before, but this is where we as believers are going to be judged for what we do for the Lord while we're still on the planet, okay? Um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this here, but in verse 14, notice it says, if anyone's work that he has built survives, okay, survives the fire or the judgment, he will receive a reward. So, so what does this mean? You know, what is this reward? Are there going to be rewards beyond salvation? Um, I believe so. And these are rewards beyond just making it to heaven, okay? And in fact, if you look in the, throughout scriptures, um, there are five crowns or rewards that are mentioned, okay? If you look in 1 Peter 5, verse 2 through 4, there it speaks of the crown of glory, and this is for a position of oversight on earth. Um, if you look in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 25, there it speaks of the imperishable crown. So this is running God's race with endurance. Um, 2 Timothy 4, 8 speaks of the crown of righteousness. 
Okay, this is y'all looking for, are loving his appearing. 1 Thessalonians 2.19 speaks of the crown of rejoicing, and this is a soul-winning crown. And then James 1.12 is a crown of life. Um, this is for faithful endurance and enduring um, temptation. So these are, are listed there throughout Scripture. Um, and then notice in verse 15, it says, If anyone's work is burned up, he will experience loss, but he himself will be saved, but only as through um, fire. So any individual's work that burns up, they will be saved. Um, however, they will suffer losses, and there it's speaking of those rewards, okay? Um, but you, you know, you make it to heaven, um, but, but you make it with no, no rewards, okay? That's, that's what it's speaking of here. And when you think about it, these are people that have chosen to build with materials that are weak. They're not solid. And those that have not continued maturing or growing in the Lord are going to build with those weak materials, like the straw and the hay that is easily going to be burned up, okay? Um, so that's why we need to continue growing in our maturity for the Lord. That way we can contribute solid materials on the foundation of Christ Jesus. Now, in the last two verses here, verse 16 and 17, um, it says, Don't you yourselves know that you are God's temple and that the Spirit of God lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and that is what, um, that is what you are. So because the Holy Spirit, God's presence on this planet right now, is the power and the person of the Holy Spirit, um, lives in you, lives in me, lives in the church. Um, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, okay? We are the temple. We are the church, all right? So if you think about, about that symbolically, you know, as we continue building the church, we need to continue building ourselves first because we are the church. It's not this physical building, right? That's just symbolic. And that's why as we continue growing in the church, in, in the Lord rather, we can continue building the church, right? Contributing to the building of God's kingdom, by growing in the faith and leading others to the faith. And that's how we build the Lord's kingdom there, as he's called us to do in different ways. And unfortunately, with the Corinthians, what we saw here was that there was a lot of divisiveness and division. And because of this, they were enslaved to men and not enslaved to the Lord. And they therefore were acting like children, not ready for that solid food. And that did not allow them um, to do the things that the Lord truly had called them to do. So in closing this morning, there were several things that we talked about. We learned that like the Corinthians, even today, um, there are a lot of carnal Christians, right? We, we think of this as this contradicting term, but really it exists, right? Those have, have allowed the flesh to continue to rule in their lives as opposed to the spirit to rule in their lives. And those two are always imposing one another, as the book of Galatians tells us. We also saw through the Corinthians that there was evidence of divisiveness there in the church body. Um, we also see that being carnal Christians, as carnal Christians, we limit ourselves as far as our maturity level in the Lord. And we want to continue maturing because if you're not growing in the Lord, you're comfortable and you can become complacent and that's a bad place to be. You want to continue growing in the Lord. You never want to be comfortable um, where you're at in Christ Jesus in terms of your, in your walk. You want to continue growing and asking the Lord to help you do that. See, that way you can continue eating um, that solid food. We also learned that everyone has a function in the building of the church. Okay, think about the church body. Um, and we need to be responsible for the materials that we add on to the foundation, which is in Christ Jesus. It's rooted in Christ Jesus. We also learned that our efforts, our work, it'll be judged and it'll be rewarded. So that's why we need to continue building the Lord's kingdom because he's called us to do it. And then the last thing we talked about was the fact that the church is the temple because the Holy Spirit, all of us physically, we're the temple of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit lives in us and continues to dwell in us. And, you know, as individuals, but also as a whole, as a church. So once again, it's very important that we continue maturing, growing in the Lord and busy building the Lord's kingdom. You know, Pastor Chuck used to always say, you have only one life and it'll soon be passed and only what's done for Christ will last. And then the Lord, in his words, Revelation twenty two twelve, 12, he says, Look, I am coming soon and my reward is with me to repay each person according to his work. So let us continue growing in our 
Christian maturity, our Christian walk, and building the Lord's church together. Amen. Well, if you're watching uh, via the live stream this morning, we want to thank you so much uh, for taking the time. And um, if you're here in person or maybe even via the live stream and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we want to give you that opportunity uh, this morning. And um, if that's you, if you're watching via the live stream or even here in person, um, if you could just close your eyes and repeat this prayer after me, if you're ready to declare him as your Lord and, um, and Savior this morning. So if that's you, if you cl close your eyes, bow your head, and uh, just repeat this prayer after me. Well, Jesus Christ, this morning I want to declare you as my Lord and Savior. I pray this morning, Lord, and I ask that you come into my life. I believe, Jesus, that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you were buried. And I believe that you rose from the dead three days later. I recognize that I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Change me and use me for your glory. Amen. If you prayed that this morning, we want to welcome you to the family of Christ. And I can assure you that there is um, a celebration going on in, um, in heaven for you right now. And um, if, you, if you're watching via the live stream, you want to learn more about uh, maybe how to get connected with a Bible teaching church, or maybe um, you want to come visit, or you want to learn more about what maybe your next steps are as you're taking this step of faith to invite the Lord into your life, uh, please leave a message there, call the church, or you can come visit us in person. We meet every Sunday morning at 10 a.m., and our building is located at the corner of Hondo Pass and um, in Gateway South. Uh, we, we thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, we pray you have a blessed day. We love you, and we're, we will be praying for you and hope to see you again soon.